my question would be to you right off the bat is why after so many years of silence never having a media interview and people have said that you have given them interviews in your well past. that's hogwash yeah that's, that's strictly hogwash so we're saying I'm constantly today. told that it, that i i've misquoted constantly saying that I, I said this and i said that and it's not happened so it's pretty well established in this this is the first time you're speaking publicly uh, about your case right yeah I've always felt that my attorneys were handling it, and, and they said to keep a low profile and stay away from it. And uh, in light of all that has been used against me mm -hmm. in the media, they've, they've created this fantasy monster image, and it's been going on for the last 12 years. And I've ever had no comment, and I had no uh, need to talk to the media for the simple reason that they were looking for sensationalism and they were looking for the monster. When you say fantasy monster uh, image, uh, what, what are you referring to by that? Well, the idea that th that I'm I'm uh, a homosexual thrill killer and all that that garbage, and uh, they painted this image of me that uh, like I, I strolled down the streets and stalked young boys and, and slaughtered them. Hell, if you could see my schedule, my work schedule, you know damn well that I was never out there. Well, you you were now you were indicted, convicted, and sentenced on 33 counts of of, of uh, homicide. Is that correct? That's correct. So yeah, I was going to ask you, in so far as sound goes, do, if I'm down with my head, does that hurt your sound quality? No, it's okay. Just don't try not to move around too much. Break, if you're breaking the song, give me a cue. I ain't going to break any song. We'll go into the lead-in as to, as you know, you were at 1978. Yeah. You were present. Yeah. Okay, but that's that's where I'd like to start, and I'd like to co kind of hey, go what through. What do you the got there? Let's see your list. Well, I, I just like to go through the generalities. Maybe talk about the background of the thing, the the the, uh, the original case. Uh, bleeping of the language. I will watch the language. Yeah, I'm just gonna try. <laughs> John does tend to slip into. Uh... Well, I I call it as I see it, and some yeah. people can't understand that. All right, so whenever the hell they're ready. Now, give me kind of just an overview of the business that you eventually uh, established, the, the uh, construction work. Is this self-taught so then, the, the construction <clears throat> and yeah. maintenance work? I started doing painting, and then I started doing wallpapering and decorating. And inside of three years, uh, PDM, which is painting, decorating, and maintenance, was doing a million dollars a year. And that was... And a, I only had four employees. Yeah, and that was a, the business you were in at the time of the arrest. That's correct. Yeah. PDM in 1974 became a corporation, and then I owned PDM Contractors Corporation. I owned PDM Plumbing, PDM Concrete, and PDM Decorating. Mm -hmm. And then I branched off with another partner into Rafco Construction. Mm -hmm. And from there, uh, we were doing strictly drugstores. Mm -hmm. John? Now, they did not search the house at that time or look through the house? No. Mm -hmm. According, according uh, afterwards, they're, they're claiming that they came to the front door of the house and knocked on the door and that I hid from them. Why, why didn't you let them in at that time when they were knocking at the front door? There was no way I could have heard them. I was, I was way in the back of the house, in the, in the rec room, on the telephone. When they walked, finally walked, walked around the side of the house, I could look out the picture window, see them there, because I was on the phone, and they could see me clearly, too, sitting on the couch on the telephone because I was talking to my sister in regards to a death in our family. So I, I told her that I would call her back, got up, went to the door, and, they, and he introduced himself as Cozen, Zach, and Pickell, and they wanted to come in and talk to me about uh, Robert Peast. And I had told him that I had not had any conversation with him, but I said, if you want to talk to me, then come back there. We just... And they wanted me to come down to the police station. Okay, well, I didn't have time because I was doing work for the county and, and stuff like that. Went into the police station finally on the next day. after This was after Kozenzak and Pakel were at the house. They had asked me to come in and uh, give me an account of my whereabouts. The thing of it is, is that uh, uh, on that same day, they held me there at, for nine hours. And while holding me there for nine hours, they executed a search warrant. The first search warrant was executed on December 13th. That is the search warrant where they claim they went through the house looking for Robert Peace. It was written up to be looking for Robert Peace, and Robert Peace wasn't there. Uh, the police had uh, uh, focused in on you as being the suspect and the missing boy, and eventually... Uh, well, they were following me around. Following you. Yeah, constantly. And on December 13th, I had made a statement to the police department, and from that date forward, mm -hmm. uh, they were had me under surveillance. The only trouble is, is that the, the Mickey Mouse way they were doing it, they had two cars following me day and night. Mm -hmm. 
and they had trouble keeping up with me, so I used to go out to the car in the morning and tell them where I was going, so in case they got lost. Because at the time, I was doing five construction jobs in five parts of the city. So in an essence, I was all over the place. But this was like Keystone Cops trying to follow me around. There's that one photograph of you and Rosalind Carter. Um, yeah, Mrs. Rosalind Carter. Well, the, the Secret Service tries to cover it up and said, well, we don't know how he got into the picture. Uh, hell, I was in charge of the uh, reception. I had to stand at the door and let them know which politicians were allowed in and which ones weren't. The thing of it is, but the, uh, the Secret Service wanted to cover up and make it sound like that I had no business there. I was cleared and I was with the Secret Service at the time and setting up the parade route and everything, because I used to set up the parades for the Polish Alliance. And then for three years in a row, I had set up the parades to to run. And, you know, that's a big feat, getting uh, 20,000 Polish people to go in one direction at one time. The subdivision uh, where the Somerdale House is located is built on a clay field. And when it rained, the rain would come down from both ends and would flood from, from one house to the other. The crawl space would fill up with water. In uh, 1976, I asked a landscaper, I said, what do you do for for the, that sour odor of clay. And he said, spread white lime, just regular masonry lime. On the ground, he said, it'll sweeten up the clay and you won't have that odor. It's sort of like what charcoal does in filtering thing. That's why the lime was sp spread in the crawl space. How, how much lime was spread down there eventually? Uh, I think seven or 800 pounds of it. The first search warrant was executed on December 13th. However, what is strange is you had 20 trained officers that came into that house, supposedly went down in the crawl space, crawled around. There was no mounds of dirt, there was no odor, there was no nothing. I never feared anybody going down the crawl space. The clowning was relaxation for me. I enjoyed entertaining kids. Like some people are, uh, you know, they, they unwind in different ways, either, either by going out drinking or that. I could put on clown makeup and I was relaxed. And I enjoyed doing it. I it was uh, it, uh, twice. A, it was only twice a month that I did yeah, it. Yeah, this I was, was not used then for a lure to to draw kids to you. Is as, uh, as, uh... no, we would visit uh, different hospitals and uh, entertain the children there. And we didn't entertain them with handcuffs or anything like that. All we used was uh, balloon animals and small toys and stuff like that. But we also did parades. And in the summertime, like on Fourth of July, I used to be in four parades in one day. I've always told people when, when I got into clown makeup, I regressed into childhood. It was fun being a clown because you could you, you could be yourself or, or just let yourself go and act a fool. You could be slapstick and funny and have a good time. That's why I always enjoyed clowning. Clowning has taken a bad name I, because of what they've used in my case. On a historical note, your, your Iowa conviction goes back to what year was that? 1968. 68. And what was just in, in a nutshell, you know, without getting in too deeply, what was the uh, the basis of the Iowa conviction? The basis of it was a sodomy conviction. It's the only thing I, I ever was sentenced to was a sodomy conviction. They're claiming that the state representative's son, who was on the other party, uh, he claims that he was sexually abused by me. And in essence, he was blackmailing me for it. Now, what it boiled down to was oral copulation and it was uh, consensual. I moved to Waterloo, Iowa. I was honored as man of the year because besides working full time, I also, you know, I was the chaplain for the JCs and also ran the membership campaign. And of course we used pornography. Uh, we had uh, stag shows and that's how we increased the membership from 150 to 400, 400 members in that JC chapter. We were dealing with porno films mm -hmm. and we, we had a girl set up in a room in that. So it was, you know, the, the thing to do. We were boosting membership from it. So nobody said a word about it. At the time, uh, this young individual made the charge at me. He was blackmailing me. He wanted more and more money. He said, look, I gave you a blowjob. Now you, you got to pay for this. You gotta... I said, uh, go, go see your father. He wasn't getting along with his father. But they came down heavy on me. But how about your dad, uh, John? Well, you had mentioned that uh, you could never really uh, please him, that he had r r talked to, of you. And, and I did not hate my I didn't hate my dad either. But he d you did have a hard upbringing with him, did you not? My, my dad came from the old country. 
uh, limited education, but he was a good provider and with strong will and strong views. He was also an alcoholic, sorry to say. Was he abusive? Did he strike out at you? When, when he, he drank, he was almost like a different person. Uh, my dad uh, struck all of his children all the time. Yeah. When you paroled out, where did, where did you set up, uh, establish uh, your residency? I was, I was under the interstate compact. I was paroled back to Illinois. Mm -hmm. And you went to Springfield first, did you not? No. No? Directly to Chicago Directly because Chicago. I had a job working at Bruno's Restaurant. That was the requirement of, a, of interstate compact transfer. You had to have a job and a place to stay. I moved in with my mother in the condominium. I had, my dad had just passed away. So yeah. I, I, I lived with my mother okay. and worked at Bruno's as a chef. When I first got out on parole for the next two years, I stayed with Bruno's Restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I worked for them. But on the, on the side, I used to work from, I used to go in at four in the morning and get off at two o'clock in the afternoon. And to me, that was too short of a day, mm -hmm. not enough work. So I started doing odd jobs painting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that on the weekends, the afternoons and the, and the weekends, I was making more money than I was as a chef, mm -hmm. even though I was getting uh, 12 something an hour. Mm -hmm. I borrowed $600 from my mother and through odd jobs, I left the uh, chef business. I, uh, I owned PDM contractors. PDM was able to work 52 weeks out of the year while most construction companies set, shut down for the winter. I never had time to shut down because I had them on the waiting list. Our business was growing at that rapid rate. That Somerdale house was rented to PDM contractors. Mm -hmm. And like the living room was the front office. Mm -hmm. The dining room of that house was like a boardroom because it was a, a an eight by uh, 10 foot table with big caps and shares because we use it as a boardroom for meetings. John, the media has, has, has called you a homosexual killer. What is your position on homosexuality? I have nothing against it. I'm, a, I'm an outspoken liberal. I don't care for uh, the, uh, the labeling. I don't care for any labeling for that fact. Do you I claim, mean, to, I, be I've a, been, do you claim no. to homosexuality? No, I, I would uh, definitely not be mm -hmm. homosexual. Uh, I have nothing against what they do, and I, I don't deny that uh, I've engaged in sex with males, but that I'm bisexual. You're bisexual? Right. I, my preference is women, mm -hmm. and I've been married enough times and, and have children, and mm -hmm. uh, I see nothing wrong with it. My dad had conservative values. If you're out after midnight, you're up to no good. My dad did not believe it. If you're out after dark and you didn't leave a phone number, you were up to no good. So I think that's why I tended to go that way more, just to be the opposite of him. I was married twice and just because I didn't get along in the marriages. My marriages went down the drain only because I was a workaholic, working uh, seven days a week in that. There was 12 keys out to the house. 12 sets of keys? 12 sets of keys. Anybody working for PDM contractors had a set of keys for the house. So you could come and go when you wanted. And of course, my neighbors would keep me informed. They would inform me, God, while you were out of town, they, they must have been partying all night there. Who is Rossi? Michael Rossi was an employee of PDM. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, how old was he at the time? Who was he? He was 20 years old. Insofar as being bisexual, if I wanted to engage in sex, Rossi and Cram were willing to go down on me anytime I wanted to, providing they were given stuff. Now, when the when the search warrants were affected in your case, uh, they did they did find an awful lot in the crawl space of your home, did they not? Well, yeah, I, yeah. I had offered to sell them the house because yeah. I, I thought there was nothing down in the crawl space. Yeah. I had never uh, had any qualms about them going down in the crawl space. Well, how many bodies were actually lo located on the property and where? To my understanding, there was a total of twenty nine bodies or twenty eight bodies mm -hmm. were found on the property. Twenty six, twenty seven of them under the house. And the rest. One was under the driveway, one was under the garage. So that, that makes a total of 29. Okay. Now, uh, uh, from the standpoint of the arrest, when you were arrested in this, in this matter, uh, uh, this was- It snowballed. It's, it snowballed. Okay, what, what uh, was the date of that arrest, do you recall? Uh, December 22nd, 1978 is when I was arrested. The rope trick is not, uh, the way I've described the rope trick is it's nothing more than an tourniquet. Mm -hmm. And I had explained it to them. I even demonstrated it to them. We cut off the air. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to kill somebody, you you just put it on their neck and twist it three times or four times or whatever, till the person stops moving. 
And you took him where? Out on the I-55 bridge. And that's where, uh, how was he then taken from the car and placed into the into the river? Just opened up the trunk and dumped him in. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was, there was no there was no big special deal on yeah. it. I couldn't get down in the crawl space that easy, and then I had a bum back to begin with. You got to crawl on your belly to move around in the crawl space. There is no way that I could have done any of the digging down there. I had enough trouble just getting down there. Gregory Gregory Grodzik, uh Let's see, number four. Gregory Godzik had came come to work for me in 19, uh, according to this, 1976. He came to us through Taft High School through a program. He had worked for Republic Lumber Company, and then he came to work for us. And I'm not the monster image that's been portrayed in me. And the only way you can make a monster image is, is to make it look like I stalked the streets and picked up altar boys off the street. You know, they want to make them look like innocent babes in the woods, and I was swatting them like flies. My encounters were always by happen chance. If you pull up at a stoplight and there's somebody standing there waiting for a bus, if you give them a ride, and if you ask them whether, you know, do you get in anything or you want want uh, drugs or something like that, that's how it happened. Always a uh, happen chance encounter. A number of, uh, what, three or four psychiatrists, psychologists interviewed I had 13 of them. There was six for the defense and seven for the uh, the state. Yeah, what, what was the, the state position doctor... of the defense uh, psychiatrists? What, what did they feel your problem was? Uh, what did they come up with from the standpoint of... Uh... Border, uh, what the hell is it? God, I can't remember offhand. Borderline personality, uh, antisocial behavior. I don't see how anybody could be antisocial when when you were involved with the public as much as I was. How about the the uh, multiple personality issue? Oh, the multiple personality in uh, came out of uh, Dr. Reifman and Hartman. These two clowns from the uh, from the uh, Cook County there. They came to see me the first time. I said, "Do you want to talk to John Wayne Gacy, the the politician, the clown, the family man, or the businessman?" The next day, I see it in the newspaper. Gacy has four personalities. I think one of the headlines said I was a homosexual mass murder, confessed mass murder. There is no confession. And we offered, uh, uh, I offered as much as $10,000 if you can produce a confession where I confess to a crime. The time that I was interrogated by the police officers, there was no stenographer, there was no tape recording, there was no videotaping. Nothing was ever taken down yet. Everywhere you'll see there's there's five confessions by John Wayne Gacy. Now, if I confess to something, then why wasn't it videotaped? Why wasn't it recorded? Why wasn't a stenographer brought in, had it written up and had me sign it? There is no confessions in this case. What I did not know about this insanity defense is that in the state of Illinois, when you plead not guilty by reason of insanity, you're saying that you committed the crime, but that you were insane at the time. So. It's not a question of innocent or guilt anymore. What, what they're trying to do is your whole trial now becomes a, an insanity trial where you're, you're to decide whether a person is sane or insane. John, how about uh, Tim McCoy, the last one of the five that you say you have personal knowledge of? Right? Tim McCoy, even though he's the last one, he's the first one. He's the first one, actually. Right. The first of the 33. Tim Tim McCoy was, was the first one, and... Uh, Tim McCoy's name wasn't put on him until 1988. Prior to that, he was known as unknown number nine. Mm -hmm. And he was buried by me in the crawl space. Mm -hmm. That's the only knowledge that I have of it. What was the circumstances of that? He was killed in the house uh, in self-defense. And who killed him then? I stabbed him. Yeah, and it was a, a an issue of self-defense? Why, why was, uh, was he in the process of assaulting you or, or what? He was coming at me with a knife. I just took the knife away and twisted it in his hand, and that, that's what killed him. Mm. So, so at, at, at that point, uh, you, you yourself did bury him then in the crawl space. Right, and if you if you notice, he's under concrete. Did you bury any of the others in the crawl space? No, I had nothing, to, I, I had no knowledge of them. Yeah, well, why, why is it that yours, your, your first one is there, and then, you know, 20 some uh, others are, are buried down there as well. Did somebody know that you had done this with the first one, that giving them an idea? More than likely when drinking and getting high with the others, yeah. Admitting it to them. So you feel others then followed your suit in, in uh, using this as a burial ground? Without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, just to, just want to highlight on, on uh, 
John Zick. You know, they want they want to make such an issue over John Zick uh -huh. and his disappearance. I think he was killed for his car personally. And your and your personal knowledge of this of the Zick uh, uh, case then is uh, is uh, my what? personal knowledge of the Zick case is is that I had come home and Zick and Rossi were at the house. I had a few drinks. I went to bed. When I woke up the, the next morning, Rossi was sleeping on the couch and Zick was dead on the floor. Uh, I went uh, about my own business and he was gone later on. And where, where did he go? Where did he end up? I assumed he ended up in the crawl space. You, did you see him being transported down there? No, wasn't present. Didn't do the, didn't do the transporting. But when he was dead, he was dead on the floor? He was dead on the floor, yes. And did you have a conversation with anybody about that? No. In other words, I, ju uh, I just kept my mouth shut because I didn't want to get involved. Mm -hmm. My idea was to just stay out of it. Ken, let, let's step back to, to your childhood. What was your state of health as a child? At the age of 10, I was told I had an uh, enlarged bottleneck heart. Okay, and so I uh, had a tendency to pass out a lot. How about childhood illnesses? Did you have any, I mean, uh, accidents rather, any any sort of uh, I was injuries a, or accidents? When I went to uh, the other vocational school, when I first went to the vocational school, I got hit with a park swing in the side of the head, caused a masterite. At what, what age was that? <sighs> Approximately. 14, I believe. Got hit with a swing, were you unconscious? Yeah, I was taken to a medical clinic. Mm -hmm. That was at the time, that's when I started seeing that I had epilepsy. Mm -hmm. Did you have any uh, episodes of, uh, you know, uh, seizures? Seizures, yes. that, seizures were, uh, according to the doctor, they claimed that when I have an ep epileptic seizure, I had 800 times my own strength, or 800 pounds of strength. Had you ever been sexually abused by anybody? At the age of nine, there was a contractor. Uh, who building contractor? Building, building a house next door, and he used to pick me up and take me for rides and always wanted to show me wrestling holds with always pinning my head in between his legs. But at the time, I did not look at it as sexual. He was showing me wrestling holds where my head was always constantly pinned between his legs or under his legs. I was 19 when I ran away, and that was in, in 80, not 80, 60, 61. I went to Las Vegas for three months, took off, took my car and left. Yeah. I worked for Palm Mortuary being the night man picking up bodies at the hospitals and stuff for them. I worked as a night man only. I did have nothing to do with the bodies. All this talk that I slept with the dead ones or, or had sex with dead bodies, that there is no truth to any of that. You did live in the um, mortuary. I lived you? in the mortuary, yes, but not in the embalming room. I mean, they make it sound like, you know, I slept in the crypts with them. And I never climbed into a coffin or anything like that. That, that is so damn ridiculous. It, you know, it's the same thing. The contention is that I slept all night with Robert Peace. If you want to say I slept in the same house with a dead body, okay, fine, I'll, I'll buy that. But in the same room, no. And besides, the dead won't bother you. It's the living you got to worry about. I, I felt things were going to work out because I knew that I didn't do the killing and I, I thought it would come out in the trial. But Amaranthi, with, with this insanity defense, what I, and again, you can call it my ignorance of the law, and it's like I explained in a letter to uh, Chief Justice William Clark. The evidence based is on the theory that the more sensational the case is, the more crazier it sounds, the insanity defense would work. And I still think it was stupid. I, I think that they did a disservice to me and they did a disservice to the victims. And you know what, people don't understand. Uh, is I, I feel I was wrongfully convicted for 33 murders, and it was only because of sensationalism and ego. The Des Plaines Police did a sloppy investigation. This, this is, uh, I mean, it may not be the, the correct way of wording it, but the thing of it is is that they had other suspects, and they, they had tunnel vision in to say, let's it's Gacy's house, it's easier to put everything on Gacy. Yeah, your paintings, uh have improved over the years. I think we've seen some... Uh... I think I've learned from each one of them. Yeah. I guess it's the same reason why I relate to Michelangelo, because he, he was a workaholic, and Leonardo da Vinci. You know, people always ask me who my favorite artists are and why. And I did not know that Michelangelo was homosexual. It doesn't make no difference to me. He was a workaholic. He was a sculptor. He was a, he was a, a painter and, and did a lot of other things. Uh, da Vinci was a, an inventor in that. And of course, in, in my life, I've done painting, decorating, wallpapering, I've done mural work, you name it. As you know, I'm, I'm a bug about record keeping. Mm -hmm. 
all of my business records confirmed where I was, who I was with, what hotel I stayed at, what, what meals I ate, everything was in the files. And all of those files on December 29th of 1978 were confiscated by the Des Plaines Police Department. And those files there alone could have proven that I wasn't in Illinois when 16 of these murders, when they finally set the dates as to when these murders occurred. Now, you, you did say that you, you never painted yourself as an innocent uh, babe in the woods. That you, We're that, going over uh, the same thing. Yeah, We're not going to go into Basically, no. But, I mean, the point is, is if, if you feel that uh, uh, you're not covering up your part of the, the crimes, but at the same time you open up the thought that others were involved, would you be willing to cooperate with law enforcement people today to... Uh, pr avail, say, the uh, the materials that you have amassed and, and uh, to more or less pursue uh, if, in fact, there are others uh, that are on the streets that have been involved in these murders, would you be willing to cooperate and to assist to uh, to pursue that to the ends of uh, bringing others to justice? Would you be willing to do that? I get no qualms about that, but what I don't understand is why wasn't it done to begin with, Bob? The thing of it is they want you to believe that uh, I and I alone committed these these murders, and, and I had nothing to do with the murders of anyone. If anybody was involved, then how many people uh, are we talking about beside yourself? We believe there was four people involved, mm -hmm. and that would be uh, Michael Rossi, David Cram, uh, Philip Paskey. Here we, we've got a, a Philip Paskey who had a, a newsletter going out of the Cook County Jail, and, and here he is involved with a guy named John Norman, and John Norman was uh, running uh, Boys for Hire. They were making snuff films with young boys. To me, they were pimping them off. They were selling them. There, there was a crossover uh, when we checked into John Norman's background that he, he goes all the way back to uh, the early, uh, early 70s involved in, uh, he ran the Norman Foundation. He, he ran, ran Epic International and the Odyssey Foundation out of Dallas, Texas. And these were uh, organizations where wealthy men could uh, hire young boys for sexual, for sexual weekends. Male had, prostitutes. Had you ever met Norman? Have you ever had any contact with Norman? I have yet to see a current picture of him, and and therefore I'd have to say no. I, I you know, Phil Paskey may have been with him at one time or another because see, again, I came home from out of town at times, and Phil Paskey would be at the house drinking beer or something like that. Uh, David Cram is the one that brought uh, Phil Paskey in, and because uh, Cram, when he wanted, he didn't want to do nothing. He got a hold of this guy and said, "Well, this guy can get you uh, somebody for sex." I, I have a lot of things that I've forgotten that I can't remember. For instance, I can go back to my childhood and stuff, and I still remember that. But yet, you can, I can go into the '70s, and there are a lot of things I can't remember. The same thing with the victims. I've looked at all of. I don't know if, if you notice here, we got pictures of every one of the victims here. And believe it or not, for the last 12 years, I've studied these photos of these victims. And there is no, uh, we, we have a shot of all of the victims together here. And uh, when you look over at the, the photos, I have no recollection of any of them, never met them. And we've gone over this more than once. They're just names and faces. And when you, when you look at them, uh, the thing of it is, we took it a step further. We went into their backgrounds. I wanted to know where they were at, what schools they attended, who they hung out with, and what kind of activities they were into. And that's what we dug up on each one of the victims. But still, there is no association. None of them never worked for me. None of them, they never went to any places that I ever hung around, because I didn't hang, hang around that many places, unless you were involved in politics, or, or you, if you were involved in clowning, then I might have ran into you but there's no way I could have run into any of them. They've got all that jewelry that doesn't belong to the victims. They've got the two clown suits that don't belong to the victim. Just like I consider myself the 34th victim, I consider the families victims as well because they did not get uh, justice from the shoddy investigation all the way down through. It... Uh, as I told you, when the FBI first came in to check on, on me, you said that uh, you were kept out of the case back in 78, and that was only because of egos. They did not want a professional coming in and doing a, an investigation. 
So they did their sloppy investigation and let it slide that way. You see, everybody was so excited about the large, massive case, and everybody was looking with their egos as to how they could close this thing up. And you know the only one that they really hurt? You've had the, the, the victim's family bent all their hostility towards me, and they think I, I'm the monster that killed their son or took out their son and stuff like that, when in fact most of them don't even have the remains of their own sons. And you know, that's another thing everybody misses from this is that the victims' families are, are not aware that, that in a lot of the cases, they don't even have the remains of their own, their own sons. Because the Dr. Stein never turned over the whole body. And they took the, uh, they took the heads off of each one of the victims. So when you, you turn over the remains to a loved, loved one's family, they don't have the whole body. What do you actually feel that my investigation, that my case has been thoroughly investigated? I think, John, in a case like this, and I, I find this in many, many major cases, that uh, uh, things are at the time of the case are done uh, uh, rather hastily because of the fact that uh, you know there's there's pressure on. Yeah, everybody. but that's a political yeah. answer. I know. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't want a political answer yeah. from you. I want. I want a, a basic answer. Do you actually think that the investigation in my case has been done right? I believe in your case that uh, that there's needs to be. Uh, there should have been more uh, more focus on on others as there should have been others uh, checked out a little more thoroughly. That's that's the belief I've developed over these years. Yeah, I just think that we're kind of uh, wrapping it up here. We, uh, I think we accomplished something today. Uh, certainly, we put something down on tape that, uh, that has not been said. My, my feeling as a career law enforcement officer is that uh, uh, if John Wayne Gacy is guilty, then he should be punished. If John G Wayne Gacy has others involved, then they should be brought in, they should be punished. Basically, I believe in, in total investigation and total justice, and that's, that's really what I've, I've been looking for all along.